What does it mean to be funny? Uh, well, everybody's funny. I mean, uh, there's no um, there's no one way to be funny or one definition of funny. Uh, I think that uh, there's a difference between funny and comic. Uh, is is one of the things that we talk about. Um, uh, you know, in my first book, The Hidden Tools of Comedy, we talk about the fact that uh, you know, anytime anybody makes somebody laugh, they're funny. But um, but comic is is kind of an art form, and it's the way of it's the art of telling the truth, and specifically, it's about telling the truth about human beings. So that uh, when people are, I think, when people are funny, if we're talking about in terms of uh, of writers. Um, uh, directors, actors. I think what they're doing is they're they're seeing what what we see from a specific angle, from a unique angle. It's like somebody once said that fish don't see the water because it's all around them. And so comic fish, are, you know, they're going around and they're saying, "Hey, you know, it's all wet around here. Uh, have you noticed that? Uh, you you notice a thing about water? So that's you know, if there was a stand-up fish." Uh, so I think uh, I think uh, a comedian is somebody who uh, is slightly off center to where the majority are, but what he says isn't off center; it's dead center. It it totally makes sense in retrospect. So when a comedian makes a joke, uh, at you know at first the audience. He takes the audience where they don't know they're going to go, but when they get there, they go, oh, of course. So it's, it's both surprising and inevitable. The punchline of a joke is surprising and inevitable. So, so if you ask me uh, what's funny or who's funny, I, I, think, um, I think we all have the capacity uh, to enjoy humor, to, to make jokes. I mean, we, we just had our Thanksgiving dinner, right? And... Uh, and, and we were around the table and uh, people were making jokes and then away from the table, people were making jokes about the people around the table <laughs> so that, so that we, we all have the capacity to enjoy humor, to create humor, um, uh, but some of us have the capacity to see the world in, in a unique way and then share that vision in a way that is both surprising and yet inevitable. What is the comedy perception test? Ah, okay. Uh, when I first started doing workshops um, in trying to talk to people about the difference between funny and comic, um, what, we, uh, what I did was I created what I called the comedy perception test. And it was all variations on a man slipping on a banana because a man slipping on a banana is the uh, is kind of the the ground zero uh, of 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 a, of a comic joke um so it was you know just a man slipping on a banana and man slipping on a banana after uh, kicking a dog and man in top hat slipping on a banana and if i can remember all the ones uh, man slipping on a banana after losing his job um, Blind man slipping on a banana, blind man's dog slipping on a banana, and finally man slipping on a banana and dying. And I would, these were the seven, um, seven word, word pictures. And then I would ask the people in the workshop, choose which one you think is the funniest, the least funniest, the most comic, and the least comic. And um, somebody would invariably ask me, well, what's the difference between funny and comedy? And I would not answer them, uh, but I would just say, listen, you know, it's whatever you think. Um, maybe, maybe they're all uh, equally funny, maybe they're all equally not funny. Uh, just choose which one you think is the funniest, the least funniest, the most comic, the least comic. They could, you know, the two of them could be the same. And so then we start with, well, um, how many people thought A was the funniest? How many people thought B was the funniest? And after the end of that, you know, we'd total them up and, uh, and we'd say, you're all right, because funny is subjective. If you think something's funny, if you're laughing at something, to you it's funny. Um, but how useful is that 
in terms of creating narrative, either as a director or as a writer or as an actor. Because if you're chasing funny, by definition, you're chasing a fraction, a subset of the audience. Because some people thought that man slipping on a banana peel was the funniest. Some people thought that man slipping on a banana peel and dying was the funniest. And, and those people you know, thought the other person was wrong. So if you're creating a script and you're trying to make it funny, by definition, um, you're excluding a portion of the audience. Uh, because, I mean, here, let me see if I, if I can show you this. Oh, great. Um, okay. Here. Uh, I, I have a niece. Uh, she's now a, a teenager, which is causing my brother and sister-in-law no amount of pain. Uh, but when she was a little kid, I would be able to shake my keys and make her laugh. I can make uh, <laughs> Karen laugh too. Yeah, oh yeah. Look at the keys, <laughs> look at the keys. And, and so the question is, my niece is laughing, Karen's laughing, mm -hmm. so is this comedy? I mean, would you spend six months of your life developing this as a feature? You're laughing. So, so there's, the thought is that there's a difference between funny and comic. And Comic, as I said before, is the art of telling the truth about human beings. The art of telling the truth about human beings. Because basically what we're doing when we're writing comedy is we're uh, illuminating, exposing that which is both wonderful and ridiculous, glorious and absurd, about what it's like to, to be here on this planet as us. Um, and, and at this point, somebody will say, well, isn't that true about drama? And, and my response to that is usually, yeah, drama's great. Drama's great. Nobody's saying that drama isn't great. But drama helps us dream about what we could be. Would that I were as eloquent and as good looking and had as much hair as some of those people, you know, in those dramatic films and those action films. So drama helps us dream about what we could be, but comedy helps us live with who we are. Comedy helps us live with who we are. And it's, it's not incorrect to state that you can watch a dramatic film in which there's really not a lot of humor, not a lot of intentional humor. Um, but you can't watch a comedy without, without moments of pain, loss, regret, uh, failure, um, hurt. So, so for me, and I guess, I guess because uh, I teach comedy and comedy writing and I've spent my whole life doing that, I've written two books about that, um, I, I'm prejudiced. But to me, uh, comedy is the art form that really gets at what it's like to be human and, uh, and at the same time, make you laugh. So, so it has that going forward, too. And speaking of one of your two books, you have, can we just see the, the cover there? Because okay. you have the banana peel, which, how did that become synonymous with comedy? Well, I think... Um, you know, I, I actually am not sure the exact, there's somebody probably out there uh, in, in the world of the internet uh, probably will tell me that, uh, give me the exact uh, time and date that somebody <laughs> slipped on a banana peel. But I think it really was um, this, in the silent films when, um, when you, had a com you, you had no sound, so it was all physical comedy. So you had somebody slipping on something. Um, and that was, that was an easy joke. Uh, and so uh, when we were trying to figure out what would be a good cover for this, it's a great um, cover. there were all sorts of suggestions and somebody said uh, a, a gorilla playing, playing baseball and I thought, <laughs> well, okay. I'm, not sure if I, I'm not sure if a gorilla playing baseball is, you know, really, really defines what I'm talking about. So we, we, uh, my brother who's actually uh, was in advertising actually found this image for me and, um, and, and, and he sent it to me. So, uh, so I, I have my, my brother, Michael, to thank for the cover. Um, thank you, Michael. Which was, yeah, because it's this beautiful, lovely banana ready to be stepped on. 
Right. And for someone to fall. And for somebody to fall. And, and the thing is, is that some people think that uh, there's the superiority theory of comedy in which the theory is, is that we like to look down at people and we laugh at their misfortune. Um, Mel Brooks once said that uh, uh, tragedy is if I uh, get a paper cut. Uh, comedy is if you fall down a sewer and die. And that's, that's, a, funny, that's a funny joke, but I, I, I think that that's really not how it works. I think if you don't like somebody or you really look down on them, um, it's probably a, a, a television show or a movie that you, that you, you know, if you're streaming it, you turn off because you're not engaged. M my, my take on it is that you're identifying with them, that you, you know, they're suffering the, the ignominy, I think, I, I hope I'm pronouncing oh, wow. it correctly. that's a new one, um, okay. Uh, <laughs> that, that, we, that we hope we can avoid that we hope that no one will find out about, right? Uh, the time that we uh, big, gave a big speech and our fly was open. Um, so when the comic does that, when the comic actor does that, uh, you know, we're, we're not, ho, 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 that idiot. Um, <laughs> we're, we're kind of going, oh my God, there I was, but you know, and, uh, or, or, you know, thank God I wasn't there. And I think that, you're identifying with characters, which is why when uh, producers or executives tell a writer to make a character likable, they're, they're actually uh, making an error. Because it's not about making a character likable, it's making them identifiable, making you empathetic to that character, even if that character is a jerk, like Ricky Gervais in The Office, or like, uh, John Cleese in Faulty Towers, uh, Danny DeVito in Taxi. We, we don't, you know, those characters are not likable, but we kind of understand them. Maybe we've worked for somebody like them. Maybe your dad was somebody like them. And the, the power of comedy is that it's, it's life affirming. Because ultimately, the comic is basically saying, you're okay. It's okay. So you slipped on a banana peel. So a pie hit you in the face. So you, you were humiliated. So you were, uh, you failed at that and, and you, you screwed that up. You're still, you'll live. You're still alive. You'll be okay. And if, and if you're not living, then you have nothing else to worry about. So, so the comedy is ultimately uh, the art of hope. Because it, even though our characters slip on a banana peel, um, there's always the hope that they'll get up and, and something better will happen. And if you look at almost any comic film, that's what happens. Our characters start off as flawed uh, individuals who are, who are usually blind to their own flaws. And over the course of two hours, they... They, they go through a transformation. Not that everything's gonna be better, not that they're going to change, not that they're gonna be supermen or superwomen, but there's the hope at the end of it that the world is gonna be better. What's the difference between being funny and writing something that's funny? What's the difference between being funny and writing something that's funny? Uh, well, being funny is uh, you're sitting around a table and you, you make a comment. And in, in the context of what's happening around the table, uh, a bunch of people laugh. But writing funny is about creating a truth for a character who is saying something uh, inexpertly in a way that the character's not realizing he or she's being funny, but the result is, is, a, is a comic moment that the audience can appreciate. Um, and, and again, it comes from sharing your own life um, and then being truthful in 
uh, in imaginary circumstances, but being truthful in a way that lets us see the flaws. When, you know, uh, being truthful in imaginary circumstances is something that, that actors have heard uh, from, you know, Stanislavski and Meisner, dramatic actors. But if you think about what drama does, uh, it's like, it's like, you know, when people have past lives, they're never janitors. <laughs> they're always queens sure, or, uh -huh. or, or emperors or they were viziers. They're, they're never the garbage collector. They're, they're, they're never a guy who worked, who worked as, you know, as a, as a chef in a diner <laughs> in, in a past life. And so when, when, when a dramatic actor is being truthful in imaginary circumstances, they're being great, they're being serious, they're, they're accruing all types of positive virtues to themselves. The comic actor tells the truth. The comic actor allows themselves to be less than stupid because, you know, the, the point is, is that we are. We are, if we, you know, if we just tell the truth about ourselves, we're not perfect. We make mistakes, we screw up all the time. There's a, there's a wonderful moment in uh, Judd Apatow's This Is 40, where there's a, they're having a party and there are these cupcakes. And the wife just throws the cupcakes away because, yeah, we don't need all these cupcakes. And then the next scene, you see Judd Apatow eating the cupcake from the garbage. And I laughed. How can you be funny? How can you write funny? I laughed because, yeah, I've done that. Don't tell my wife. Uh, but you know, not a disgusting garbage with a lot of disgusting things, but you know, just kind of on top. So it was still a, it was sure, still a three second rule. Yeah. But but that's that's how he creates comedy. He just takes from his life, from the, from the lives of, uh, of of people that he knows, people around him, and he tries to tell the truth based on character, based on character. So you're not. Um, you're not trying to come up with the funniest thing you can think of. Uh, you're trying to come up with what would this character say in this moment? There's a, there's a, a great, uh, this is, this is old. This is, if you, if you remember radio, um, there's this great scene from Jack Benny radio series in which uh, a robber comes up to him and the robber says, your money or your life? And the, the comedy writers who were writing this, the episode were stuck. What could we say? What's his answer? So they're thinking about it. And one of them's on the couch and the other one's pacing and says, well, you have anything? He says, I'm thinking. And they went, that's it. And they gave, that's the line that Jack Benny says. So he says, somebody says, your money or your life? And there's this big pause. And Jack Benny, in his inimitable way, goes, I'm thinking, and this is the longest recorded laughter in the history of radio comedy. Uh, because that's what somebody would say when they're stuck and they don't know what to say. There's, um, there's an episode of Everybody Loves Raymond um, in which Robert, the big hulking brother, played by Brad Garrett, brings home what he thinks is the one. Uh, and that's the title of the episode, She's the One. And so everybody's talking and, and, and you know, not paying attention. And uh, Raymond's going to bring some desserts out to the table. And he sees the girl who's the one catch a fly, trap the fly, look around, make sure nobody's looking. She doesn't realize Raymond's seeing her. She picks it up. She pops the fly in the mouth. And Raymond is frozen. And he stays frozen. Ray Romano stays frozen for about four and a half minutes. And there's all action around him. And his parents come in. There's all this stuff. And finally, Robert says, so what do you think? And he just turns to her and says, she's not the one. Which is, how could you write a better line than that? But because you're not trying to be funny, you're trying to think, what would this character say in this moment, uh, given that the character is not the greatest orator in the world and, 
and, and given who he is and knowing who he is. So, so the way to write funny is to tell your own truth, to tell the truth about yourself and to tell the truth about uh, the characters who you know and tell the truth about what you know and who you know and as truthfully as possible. One, one more example from the early age of television. I'm sorry, I'm old, okay? I'll, I'll talk about TikTok in a second. Um, Norman Lear adapted this British series, uh, uh, Till Death Us Do Part, and he's adapting it for an American audience. And so he's got this character, Archie Bunker. Now, who's Archie Bunker? In the, in the British series, he's this old codger who's kind of bigoted. So how did Norman Lear, Lear write him funny? He just thought of his father. His father used to say, uh, you know, stifle dingbat. He had Archie say that. His father once said to him, you're the laziest white man and you know, whatever. He had Archie say that. How did, Ray, how did Phil Rosenthal, who's the showrunner on um, Everybody Loves Raymond, how did he write the mother Marie? Well, that's his mother. So he doesn't have to invent anything. He just has to recollect it. And the first book really tried to talk about what are the discrete tools that aren't taught in universities or conservatories that can help you take a scene that isn't working and make it work. Um, and, and we have a number of tools like uh, uh, positive action and, and metaphorical relationship. Um, and straight line, wavy line, uh, those tools in the first book are designed to help a writer or director say, okay, this scene is kind of flat, the scene isn't working, um, and what are the techniques that we can use to, to make it better, or what are the techniques that we can use to analyze why it's not working? So the whole, the whole first book was really designed to talk about what comedy is, how it works, why it works, what's happening when it's not working, and how can you fix it. And then I was, so I was doing these workshops. This is, this is before the pandemic. Uh, do you remember before the pandemic? Uh, the, you know, there was this pandemic and everybody had to stay home and not go anywhere. Uh, so before the pandemic, uh, I would go out, I would go around the world uh, no one was more surprised than me that I was been me, being invited around the world. I would go around the world and I would do these workshops. And um, inevitably somebody would say, okay, but in this script, how about this? And I would try to give them an answer. And I was doing script consultations, but it made me think, well, how does, how does what I'm talking about, how does that translate to a whole narrative? And so that's where the second book came out of, um, The Comic Hero's Journey. Uh, my friend Chris Vogler had written the, the Writer's Journey, which is based on the works of Joseph, Ca Joseph Campbell. And so uh, I ripped him off and I, I, I told him, I'm, I'm ripping off your title. No one can come up with a better title than that. But you thanked him in the forward, right? I did oh, thank good. him in the okay. forward. Uh, so I, <laughs> That's how we do it in Hollywood. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, um, I didn't give him any money, but I did thank him in the forward. Uh, so the comic hero's journey uh, was really taking a look at so what's different in a comedy, in a comic narrative uh, that is, that follows the hero's journey at, at points, but then importantly deviates it? And how does it, de how does it deviate it? And where does it deviate it? And what are those changes? And what are those important points that, that might not be covered in, in an otherwise you know, wonderful book um, by John Truby or Robert McKee or, or Chris Vogler uh, when they're specifically talking about comedy. Would you say humor is sophisticated and comedy is juvenile? I, I wouldn't. Uh, is humor sophisticated and comedy juvenile? Um, I, I, I'm not sure that I would use, I would, I would put those in those boxes. I think when we talk about humor, we're basically talking about written prose. Um, Robert Benchley, um, uh, who, you know, Sandra Singh Lowe, who else is, you know, writing comic pieces? Um, so 
in in that way because it's 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 verbal. Uh, it's li it's literally literary. You, it's the writing. Um, I'm not sure I would say sophisticated, uh, but it it it's it follows different rules and it, it follows different dictates. I think comedy comedy is designed to be spoken and performed by human beings. And I think that's that's the big that's the big difference is that comedy is is actor centric. Um, in uh, in drama, the dramatic uh, writer is trying to make a point, um, and uh, he's he's got a theme that he's trying to develop. Uh, and and even though there are characters in the drama, the important thing is that uh, his uh, his speeches uh, reflect uh, the the writers point of view um, and it's it's a, a, a literary uh, centric it's it's writer centric um, but comedy as as first performed 3500 years ago by the Greeks is an actor centric art it's made to be performed by by people who Acknowledge that there's an, an imaginary event happening, but also acknowledge that they're being being seen performing an imaginary event. Back in the Greek theater, Greek theater, Greek drama, and Greek comedy, Greek tra tragedy and Greek comedy were structured exactly the same. Um, they both had the uh, parados, the entrance of the 50-man chorus. They both had the episodes where scenes were interspersed with choral odes. They all had the exodus. But comedy, Greek comedy, had something called the anabasis, in which the 50-man chorus came forward and talked directly to the audience. They broke the fourth wall. They said, hey, hey, you, that's a pretty dress you're wearing, whatever, you know. And, and then they would go back as though it never happened and continue on to the audience. There's, there's lots of Greek and Roman dramas in which the characters in the drama acknowledge the audience, acknowledge that somebody's watching them do this. So it's very actor-centric, whereas Hamlet might have a soliloquy, right? To be or not to be, but he's not saying, so what do you think? You, you think I should be or you think I should not be? Because if he did that, it would be a comedy. The act of breaking the fourth wall, the act of owning what you're doing, owning the imaginary uh, uh, events is, is a uh, hallmark of, of comic performance. I mean, there's a reason why, so, why one person can get up and tell jokes for two hours, and that's completely accepted. Stand-up comedy. How many instances where somebody gets up and just tells us their life you know, in a dramatic way for two hours. I mean, there are some solo plays, but not as, not as ubiquitous. It's group as, therapy. Yeah. As, as, yeah, <laughs> as uh, yeah, I've seen those, I've seen those off-Broadway plays. The woe is me story. My <laughs> uncle touched me, you know. Um, so, so it's, so, so humor is written, it's literary but comedy is meant to be performed. It's not it's really not meant to be read. I mean, you could read it, you have to read it. You've written it, somebody reads it and says, I want to produce it because I think this should be uh, a, um, a, a play or, or it should be a movie, or it should be a TV series. Or even if they don't, they'll say, this is really funny, you should work on our movie or our TV series or, or you should help work in this theater because you, you know this, this thing that you wrote, which is meant to be performed, spoken, lived through, th lived through comic characters, comic actors, um, it's, uh, it's a actor-centric art. And so in that way, it can be both glorious, but also it can be also ridiculous. It can be, um, what, was the, what was the term you used? 
Oh. Um, you, you'd you call uh, humor sophisticated. and Oh, versus juvenile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it could be juvenile or it could be revealing. I mean, there's, there's a wonderful moment um, in... Uh, in Faulty Towers, when you know, John Cleese is playing Basil Faulty, he's the world's worst hotel guy, you know, hotelier. Uh, and he's everything's going wrong for him. And he just kind of looks off to the side and says, says, what was that? That was your life, that was your life, mate. Do I get another? No. I mean, there's just this moment of introspection that we don't expect from our juvenile comic characters, and yet. It's totally in place in a comedy, whereas you can watch, you know, um, I can watch a, uh, a drama and, and enjoy it totally, thoroughly, but never have, never have a comedic moment. Whereas I can't think of a good contemporary comedy that doesn't have moments of, uh, moments of tragedy, moments of loss. How does surprise factor into comedy? Hey! Okay, I don't know. <laughs> That's good. Oh, wow. I don't know. Um, <laughs> because because the, you're playing with people's expectations. So you can either surprise them or you can fulfill their expectations. Both work. Both work. You know, uh, a joke is based upon the surprise ending, you know, the, the punchline. Um, uh, waiter, waiter, there's a fly in my soup. Uh, what is the fly, you know, uh, what, uh, what is the fly doing? Uh, uh, what is that fly doing in my soup? I think it's the backstroke. You know, you're not expecting, the, uh, I think it's the backstroke because what is the conventional thing the guy should say? The, the guy should say, um, well, I'm sorry about that. We'll give you a new soup. We certainly won't charge you. So when the guy says, he literally looks at the fly and he goes, well, I think that's the backstroke. That's a surprise, surprising yet inevitable. But also there's the sense that if you don't have any idea what's going to happen, that doesn't work for comedy either. You have to have some idea of what's going on. The audience has to have some idea of what's going on to be able to enjoy the predicament the characters are in. We'll go back to that, the story about uh, um, everybody loves Raymond and he sees his brother's girlfriend who the brother thinks is the one eating a fly. So if we don't see her eat the fly and then he's just stuck, you know, he's frozen for four minutes and then he turns and says she's not the one, how is that funny? So it's not just surprise, it's also expectation. And you're playing with the audience expectation. You're uh, you're having them think one thing's going to happen, then you then you do this the other thing, or you you're, you you pull them into the dilemma of the character, and you wonder what's going to happen, and you're delighted as you see the character try and fail to solve the problem. Or, or like in The 40-Year-Old Virgin, when Steve Carell, uh, it's discovered at his job that he's a virgin. Uh, we, we know that his co-workers are going to definitely not let it go. It's going to become something. Actually, that's a surprise because he, okay. uh, he, he, they find out at a poker game. He goes home. He stays up all night. He worries. He says, oh, it's, then he tries to talk himself into, it's going to be fine. He goes to work and at first... This guy ignores it. Oh, maybe I'm cool. And then this guy just says hi, and he goes, <laughs> maybe, maybe I've dodged a bullet. And then he sees Romney Malco standing in front of a, uh, a bank of televisions showing a porn going, we're going to get you laid this weekend. And then he realizes, oh, my God. So, so it's one, two, three. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's not okay. So that's, um, that's part of of the expectation. We, we're all waiting for it. And I guess, oh, I guess it's not going to happen. Oh, then it does happen. What makes someone laugh? That's a physiological response. Um, uh, some people, some people think, some scientists think that what happens is, is your 
your brain is full of neurons and the neurons have created neural pathways. And so the neural pathways that they've created help you go from, if I ask you, uh, what's, what's your street address, you tell me, because that's a neural pathway. Uh, so when, when you, uh, or when somebody says, I dropped something, the neural pathway says, uh, either I'll, I'll pick it up or not my problem, you, you pick it up. That's, you know, that's a neural pathway. When, when you hear a joke, the joke is, is kind of fooling the neural pathway that it's gonna go down the same pathway. And then it, it, it kind of creates a different neural pathway, which because the brain is based on electricity, um, and I'm, as you can tell, I'm not a scientist, uh, but uh, what happens is, is there's, there's kind of a, almost an explosion that happens in the brain because it, it has to, you know, all, my, all of a sudden change gears, change directions. It's, it's literally creating a new neural pathway in the brain and that creates a kind of a, a physiological response uh, where, where your, your air is being brought up and, and, and it, it, comes out in, it comes out in laughter. Uh, we see this in babies, we see this in chimpanzees, the, this response where something is surprising but not dangerous. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, and so laughter can, can create, can be created. Uh, but it's based upon the fact that somebody has said something that is surprising yet in retrospect inevitable. If it's surprising but makes no sense, you just kind of go, huh? If it's not surprising, then you just going to go, okay. So, it need, so if you're creating a moment that's both surprising yet in retrospect inevitable, um, uh, that creates, that can create laughter. Uh, and then go ask uh, a neuroscientist. That's the next TED talk. Yeah, that's, the, that's, yeah. that's the next TED talk. <laughs> How important is it to make yourself laugh? Well, if you have to make yourself laugh, uh, uh, I think, uh, you, you, know, you know, take two aspirin and, and see a doctor in the morning. Uh, I, think, I think it's important that you, um, that you seek out things that will lift your spirit. Uh, for many people, it's, it's something funny, it's something, it's laughter, but, you know, some people like, like yoga. Um, you know, like, uh, like meditation, but, but I think that, uh, it's, I think it's important to see the world from a different perspective. And that's, that's partly what comedy does. It, it, it helps you see your life, uh, from a slightly different perspective. If you're, if you're watching Die Hard, that's a lot of fun. It's exciting. You can live vicariously through somebody who, who, who's daring do. You could probably never duplicate. Uh, but how close is that to your own life? But if you're, if you're um, watching Party Down about a group of uh, uh, servers in a catering company, well, maybe, uh, maybe you don't work in a catering company, but you work somewhere similar. Or The Office or Parks and Rec. Something there that is similar to you and, and, and has you see your own life, again, because it's about identifying, it has you see your own life from a slightly different perspective. Unless it's too close to your own life and then you're crying because that's, true that's your reality. That's so true maybe, too. Maybe when it's too close. Well, if, if, you're, if, you're already, <laughs> if you're already a server, don't watch Party Down, then watch Hacks. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, because sometimes when you when you're you're talking about the fish that's in the world of the water, you know, yeah. in the water, they don't know that they're in this world, the imaginary world. And so sometimes when a world is uh, like when I saw This Is Forty, to me it was hilarious. It was sort of this L.A. couple living this sort of bourgeois life, and it's not exactly my life, but I'm able to laugh at it because it's not so close to mine. If it was more my life, I think it would be. A uh, little more, uh, probably less laughter, but uh, well, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, so which 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 fictional counterpoint is closest to you? The honeymooners, 
um, oh. uh, you know, Roseanne uh, or the Connors. Um, uh, maybe not that one, but, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I did love that show, by the way. I love that one. So maybe that's why. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, I think maybe you have to have it a little more removed if it's too yeah. close to your own, because I was wondering if you're able to laugh at yourself, are you, well, that that's a very, that's a very, uh, rare talent. How many people do you know can laugh at themselves? Well, maybe past selves, not current. Maybe past selves, because anything current might be too right. And that's too painful. that's that's one of the things that comedy helps us. It has it has us laugh at ourselves. In you know, at one one step removed. So when we're laughing at um, uh, uh, Gene Arthur and and Hannah Einbinder. Uh, not Gene Arthur, Gene Smart and Hannah Einbinder in, in Hacks. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a stand-up comic, but I, I, I've been in that world. I know that world. Uh, and, uh, and if I'm laughing there, I'm also healing myself. Because some of the things that they've gone through, I've gone through, and maybe I haven't laughed about it. But this, this helps me see that through that perspective. So, so in that way, a comedy is, um, is just as good as therapy and, and less expensive. Right. And no one's taking notes. And no one, yeah. uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not. Okay. Well, one of the things that's great about comedy, especially contemporary comedy, um, is that it, it no longer avoids uh, the, the, the fact that we all change. When, when the radio sitcoms trans, translated or were trans, um, transformed into television sitcoms, the formula was a, a central character who had a good sense of humor um, would solve a solvable problem in 22 minutes by interacting with a small, group of characters and and everything stayed the same so that uh, any one episode of, of a sitcom is viewable because any other episode of the sitcom uh, was basically the same dynamics and that was okay but what's changed because of cable because of streaming just because of people's tastes um, is that what you see now is that characters in sitcoms all change. It's all about transformation. So it used to be that only a character in, in, a, in a long form narrative, in a film, would change, you know, Bill Murray in Groundhog Day from the beginning to the end, Scrooge, which is not really funny, although it has some funny moments, uh, uh, and, and, all, and all the comic uh, takeoffs on The Christmas Carol and Scrooge. Um, I think there's one with Ryan Reynolds and Will Ferrell out now. Um, you know, they come and they uh, starts in one place and then they change. But now, um, uh, with uh, Hacks, with Ted Lasso, um, uh, somewhere, someplace. I think that's the name of it. It's uh, this uh, uh, thing that takes place in Oklahoma. Uh, reservation Dogs. Uh, they, they're, it's all about change. It's all about what happens as we're changing, what happens to make us change, what happens as we, uh, as we re resist change in, in, in a way that isn't just, this is us. Which, by the way, for those of you who like This Is Us, that's okay, I hated it. If a writer is having a script reading what cues will they pick up on to know that the script is no longer funny? The crickets, the silence. Um, I, I, I think it's important that if you're having a script reading, you record the entire event because at a certain point, um, you won't be able to listen or observe uh, uh, objectively anymore. And so record the entire event because it'll surprise you. The things that you thought didn't go well, 
you'll hear, uh, you might hear more response than you thought there was because, you know, maybe you were fixated on this didn't go well or that didn't go well. Or conversely, uh, if you thought everything was swimmingly and then you hear it back and you hear the, here's what happens with friends who come to your readings. <laughs> yeah, first minute one through minute seven, lots of laughter. But after seven minutes, you know, you've, if it's not happening, if, it, if there's nothing alive happening, uh, the laughter peters out. And then there's a, always these one or two people who are just, they just love you. And so you'll, an uh, actor will say a line and, <laughs> and it'll be, it'll be a solo, just, just, just standing out. And you know, well, that's just, that's just pity laughter or that's just supportive laughter. But, but you'll, the cues are, are people engaged or are people not engaged? If they're engaged, something that's, something that you wrote is working. If they're not engaged, something you wrote is not working and it's not the audience's fault. It's not the people, it's not the people listening to the readings fault. Um, it, you know, it, it might be something that you can easily fix or, or maybe, maybe there's an outside reason that has nothing to do with the script. But most writers who look for that outside reason are avoiding their own responsibility for creating a dramatic event, a comedic dramatic event that is engaging. So here's the most important thing. Rather, rather than uh, looking for the, you know, the clues or the hints of what's going well, and what's not going well, after the reading, you want to ask your audience to tell you four things and, and, and just what parts, what parts were you engaged in? What parts were you not engaged in? What characters did you want to see more of? What characters did you not want to see more of? Where were you confused? And that's all, that's all you need to know. Don't ask for any, don't ask for any suggestions. Don't, don't ask, well, what do you think when she, when she said this in, act, in, in, in the second part? No, no, you don't want suggestions. Neil Gaiman is a writer who once said that 95% of the criticisms you receive are correct, but 95% of the solutions you're offered are incorrect. Meaning if somebody doesn't like something, that's real. A human being didn't respond to what it was. That is absolutely useful information, but why they didn't like it, what you should do about it, that you should throw out. Because it's really about taking the, your, your own EKG of the script. You don't want that EKG machine to say, well, you know, you should eat more fiber. <laughs> no, you just, you know, something, something's not going right and I got to figure it out myself. And it seems like if you invite people that you know, whether they're actors and they're in the industry or not, they're going to have a similar sense of humor. And not so then, no, okay. Do you have friends that have an opposite sense of humor? I, you know, again, senses of humor are are uh, variable. They're they're uh, everybody has a different sense of humor. So uh, I think somebody once said that that you know, they never heard Lorne Michaels laugh in an audition. <laughs> You know, and that's a scary thing. You're there and the guy who you want to hire you never responds. And so that can make you go crazy. But everybody has their own sense of humor, their own, uh, their own specific sense of criteria that makes them laugh or not laugh. But you, people are either engaged or not engaged. I mean, you know, are they shifting around in their seat? Are they... Um, are they leaning forward? Meaning, what's going to wonder what's going to happen next? Um, so, so when when you're when you're doing a reading, the important thing is to uh, don't spend a lot of don't spend a lot of your time trying to rehearse the readers. You're just doing more damage. Um, you don't have enough time to do it well, and you have enough time to screw things up. So just give them the script, 
make sure that the stage directions, if any, that are read out loud are clearly delineated so people don't trip over themselves. And make sure that you have an equal number of listeners to the people who are reading so that you get some sort of a sense how things are going and serve wine and cheese and wine, you know, and, and, and more wine so that, so that people are in a receptive mood. What makes a great comic premise? A great comic premise. In a way, uh, I, I don't want to say it has to be this because in reality, uh, if you have an idea and you write it out and it works, that, that premise was great for you. It's, so it's not something that's objective. It's something that's subjective. It's something that, that creates a desire in you to tell the entire story. I mean, haven't you ever seen a, a blurb for a movie and you said, I wish I had thought of that. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for something to stir your own imagination so that the, the story is, is kind of exploding in your own imagination before you even can get to the, the, the typewriter or the, uh, the computer. Uh, so, uh, so for me, uh, it's very subjective. I think what what some things that are common to great comic objectives is the 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 big lie that there's some impossible or improbable thing that could never happen or could probably never happen. But since it does happen, it affects this main character and these other. Um, supporting characters and you wonder, well, what will happen then? So, so when you create a comic premise, um, the, the, the better the premise is, the better it is a tool to excite your own imagination, to, to make you go, oh my God, I, I, I got to write this down because it's, it's, it's already occurring to you in your, in your, in your own imagination, in your, in your own head. Um, there are a couple of, things that you want to think about uh, as you develop it, you want to tell one lie and one lie only. So, so in other words, um, let's say your uh, comic premise is that there's this, uh, there's this anthropomorphic duck, right? Or chicken, there's this anthropomorphic chicken, this little chicken. And the chicken thinks that the sky is falling and he made a big deal about it and it turned out the sky wasn't falling. And so he's embarrassed his father and he's embarrassed himself and he's humiliated himself at a time of life in which chickens don't want to humiliate themselves, middle school. Now that's the premise of Chicken Little, the Disney movie. In the middle of Chicken Little, there's an alien invasion. Okay. I would say that maybe you don't need the alien invasion, that maybe you need, if you didn't think your story of in an, a humiliated chicken trying to, you know, dig out from under the humiliation in middle school was enough of a story, then you wanted to come up with a different premise. You wanted to create something differently um, so that it would propel you to the end of the story. If you're throwing in an alien invasion, you're telling me all uh, right away, well, this idea wasn't good enough it wasn't strong enough to, to sustain. Um, the Pixar movie Inside Out. The Pixar movie Inside Out had a great premise. The premise is, is that all these different aspects of our personality, they, they all have, they, they're all alive in our brains. And uh, what happens is, is that two of them somehow get shunted off to, uh, to another, another region and the little girl whose brain it is starts going amok and they got to get back. Wow, that's a, that's a great premise. Now, could that ever happen? I don't know. Are there little people in our brains telling us what to do? It's an interesting idea. So what would happen then? Now, the premise is only the start because you have to, you have to people, you have to develop the premise through character and theme. Because ultimately, 
even though it's a movie about a guy who wakes up it's the same day every day or a guy or a guy who kid who wishes he was big and he wakes up and he's a 30 year old man or a bunch of uh, uh, personalized entities in some little girl's brain what is it about and when when somebody asks you what it's about they're not asking you what's the premise they're asking you what's the meaning why am I spending two hours watching this and who are the characters that are happening to because you have to develop the premise through character as opposed to well now I'm gonna make the characters do this now I'm gonna make the characters do, do that what would the characters do given this premise guided by the theme so Inside Out is a, is a great story uh, because I think for two years and again somebody on the internet will correct me on that uh, I think for two years they the if you know Inside Out uh, uh, Amy Poehler played Joy and uh, I forget the name of the actress I think something Smith Lois Smith maybe played Sadness and as you know, Lo you know Joy and Sadness go on a trip but for the first two years it was Joy and Fear Amy Poehler and Bill Hader and the movie didn't work the movie didn't work because no matter what they did they had funny stuff happen but it just was not not coalescing because when they went back and I think they had child psychologists and neuro, neuro, neuroscientists come to talk to them they realized that the opposite of joy isn't fear the opposite of joy is sadness and you can't have joy without sadness which is the theme that you have to be to be a fully actualized person you need all parts of yourself you can't just dismiss one part and it didn't work with fear so when they finally got the idea we have to we've, we've got the wrong characters on this journey then the movie then the movie kind of found its way and 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 took off so a, a comic premise is some impossible you know in 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 the comic hero's journey book I call it WTF what the fuck something something happens that that is either impossible a guy wakes up the same day over and over again that's impossible or improbable um, a, a, a woman decides to go to uh, her best friend's wedding in order to uh, destroy it could that happen sure but you know mostly you're you're you know if you if somebody's got if some guy's getting married and you think well I should have married him maybe you just stay home and drink that weekend um, <laughs> so impossible or improbable and then who are the characters that are called on characters are called on either through need or theme you need a character in Groundhog Day you need a cameraman because how is he going to do a remote if nobody's holding the camera but then you also have characters brought on through theme ultimately Groundhog Day is about how can you be a good person in the world and so you needed the world and so they they said it uh, because Groundhog Day happens in a small town that small town becomes the world and those are the old other than the station manager in the very beginning of the picture that we never see again the only other characters are his producer the, the the love interest you know the magical object of desire uh, and everybody else in the town uh, because you know who's not in Groundhog Day the president of the United States because it has nothing to do with politics his mother because it doesn't really have anything to do with family or Stephanie if you Google Groundhog Day what will come up in the in the uh, in Google very very top of the list is the second draft done by Harold uh, Ramis and Danny Rubin and in that second draft there's this character called Stephanie which is which was a response to a executive uh, note saying how does this happen I don't believe I, I don't know how it happens you got to put the audience will be confused the audience will be confused you have to put something in there that explains to them how it happens so Harold Ramis put in against his better judgment he put in um, 
the character of Stephanie, who's into Ouija boards and crystals, and, and she was dumped by Bill Murray's character, and so she puts a curse on him. So think about it. Groundhog Day, if you know Groundhog Day, if you don't know Groundhog Day, go watch it. It's really a wonderful film, even though it's many, many years old. Um, character of Stephanie. Well, if she puts a curse on him, then don't you have to go back and get her to take the curse off? And, and then doesn't that diminish the theme to be, as opposed to how can you be a good person in the world, to be how could you be a good boyfriend? Kind of diminishes it. So when the people who ran the studio were all fired and a new executive came in, uh, the guy said, what do you need this character of Stephanie for? a recorded instance of a good executive note. And so they took it out because they never wanted it in the first place. Could Groundhog Day worked if Rita had been the arrogant, selfish one and uh, the Bill Murray character, Phil, was it? Yeah. Uh, had been this kind, sort of gentle man. Could it still have been funny? What if we switched, what if we took the, the two characters and switched their roles? Well, but who's, who's waking up the same day over and over again? That's a good point. Okay, what you if, see, it, if it if yeah. it's if it's still him, then why are we torturing this nice guy? Okay, what if it was Rita? Well, then that would, that would work if she was somebody who needed to go on the journey. You don't want to pull wings off of flies. You don't want to torture characters who don't need transformation, who don't need torturing. Characters who go through trauma need to go through the trauma. Thank God for the trauma, because the trauma helps them transform. So if they don't need the trauma, then you're just, you're just torturing somebody for really no good, not a great reason. What is the lie that tells the truth? The lie that tells the truth is the comic premise. It's uh, you're, you're constructing a lie in order to get to the truth of something. Uh, how can you be a good person in the world? Well, you know, maybe you wake up and you, um, you, you do good things and maybe you work for a nonprofit and you, if you see somebody homeless, maybe you give them a dollar. But not very amusing. So you create a lie to get to that truth. And so you start off with somebody who uh, is not a good person in the world, um, as in Groundhog Day. And he go and you then you there's this lie there's this impossible thing that happens or improbable thing that sends him on a journey in which the the question that you're that you're pondering is explored because it's ultimately for me theme is best expressed as a question um, as opposed to love you know uh, theme of Romeo and Juliet love conquers all maybe. But don't they both die at the end? I mean, so, so you know, that seems, a theme as a postcard is not as useful to you as theme as a question. Because in Romeo and Juliet, maybe Shakespeare is exploring what's the nature of love. Because you see in Romeo and Juliet all sorts of different sorts of love. There's the love of Romeo for his bros, Benvolio and Mercutio. There's the love of Juliet for the nurse. There's the malicious, um, you know, kind of uh, grasping, you know, love, if you can call it love, of Tybalt, the evil, the evil cousin uh, for, for Juliet, because he wants to control her and not have her see Romeo. So there's all sorts of different sorts of love. So you're exploring a question that you're taking the time to explore in your writing, as opposed to, you know the answer, and now you're just, you know, kind of connecting dots because maybe you don't know the answer. How's, how's that? Maybe, maybe it's just something you're thinking about and you're not sure. And so by, you, by using this narrative, you're exploring it yourself. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's you know, four months to six months of hard work and you already knew where you are gonna go. Um, a lot of uh, uh, script uh, books tell you you should always know where you're ending up. But even that's not always true. And not every great writer writes that way. If you're going to write a mystery, yeah, I think you should know who killed, who killed the guy 
or the girl at the beginning. Um, but I think it's important to observe the, the passing moments in comedy because that's where the comedy comes from. Not from, I need to get from here to here, but what's happening here? And look around and wow, that's weird. And if, you, if you're just writing from here to there, you're gonna miss the weird thing that your character with their eyes notices and with their mouth says something about it or does something about it. So I think that's more useful. So the lie that tells the truth is your basic comic premise that is the gateway to exploring the truth of whatever you're, whatever you're talking about, whatever your theme might be. So to go back to the, the initial idea for the film, a person works at a nonprofit, uh, they're, they're kind to the homeless, and it, we could spice it up if there was an actual purpose to that journey. Maybe. Okay, here's a person, um, they say they're, 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 um, uh, they work at a nonprofit, they're kind to the homeless, they, 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 they drive, they, they drive a, you know, a Prius, they, they only eat gluten-free, and let's say they win the lotto, and they win four, you know, what was, what was that, that prize that was there a couple of months ago? Um, I think it was like a billion, two billion dollars, and they win two billion dollars. Will it change them? How will it change them? What will happen? What will happen to their preconceptions, to their notions? Now, if nothing happens, I would say, well, you have the wrong character because you want a character who's going to go through a transformation. So, so uh, that's, you know, that's why it's not just come up with a funny idea and then run with it. Well, who's the character that's going to go through that? WTF, that what the fuck moment. Uh, and and how do they how do they need to go through that what the fuck moment and and what are you saying about them? And what are you saying about the nature of whatever it is you're writing about, the nature of? So what I'm curious, that'd be an interesting arc. So maybe they get all this money and it changes their perceptions. Maybe they thought wealthy people were evil and then they come to find out, oh, they're not so bad after all. And then they become the very person they despise. Maybe, you see, that, that's, that's the joy of, of writing and developing an idea is that, you, is that when I do these workshops, um, uh, I used to do them in, you know, live uh, in Tel Aviv, in Mumbai, now I'm doing them uh, on Zoom, and I don't think I don't think people ever want to get off Zoom. I think they want to get off Zoom, but I think it's like, why do I have to fly to Los Angeles to take this workshop? I can just turn on my computer. So anyway, um, I, I would say there would be let's say 25 people in the room. If you came up with that idea, woman works at a nonprofit, wins the wins two billion dollars in the lotto. There could be 25 different ways of developing that idea, each of them valid. There's no one way to develop a premise. It's the premise is just a tool. It's another tool to, to help, you, uh, help you excite the imagination to develop the story in your head. But in some sense, that arc will come out the other side, though. Yeah, it should. Okay. Doesn't doesn't need to. I mean, uh, if if the... Let's say there's a guy, and at the end of the movie, she's together with the guy. So that's a mainstream movie. Or let's say at the end of the movie, the, her and the guy go different ways. So it's an indie movie, right? <laughs> so so it, could be either, it could be either way. Sure, that's true. And she's in therapy for the rest of her life. And... Maybe. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so nothing is predetermined. Nothing is predetermined other than, you know, if you need... 400, you know, $400 million to make it, well then, that's, you're going to have to make compromises in order to get $400 million. But if you can make it for $40,000, you can just do anything you want. The, I think the point is, is that whatever the idea is, whatever the lie is, you're using it in, in, in the enterprise of finding out the truth about something for yourself first before an audience. Because if you think you know what the answers are, 
why are you wasting time writing a movie? You know, why don't you just uh, go out and change the world? I, I, think, I think most people wonder what the answers are. At least most comics wonder what the answers are and use narrative as a way of trying to figure that out. How do you know if your comedy idea is too far-fetched? I think it's only far-fetched if, if you can't, if somebody can't relate to it. Um, what's the movie, Everything All at Once? Oh, uh, yes. Uh-huh. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Excellent. What could be more confusing than everything, everywhere, all at once, except for the fact that it was my relationship they're talking about? And I'm going, oh, my God, I understand exactly what they're talking about. Because it, it not only was great sci-fi and mind-bending and, and full of all sorts of, you know, you know multi-dimensions, but it was also about, you know, honey, look at that. You know, the, the guy with the waist, band, waist pouch, that's me. You know, um, uh, so, so far-fetched is only, only means that somebody isn't able to relate to it. And you only need one person to relate to it. Uh, how many, you know, how many rejections did uh, did they get? Did she get for Harry Potter? Um, you know, all you need is 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 one person. On the other hand, work on something else at the same time. Because because the one thing you don't want to do is to flog the same horse. Um, that that the time that you're spending trying to convince the world that this is a great script, you could use some of that time to write your next script. Because uh, every successful writer will tell you that first script helped me write the, the seventh script that sold. As opposed to, you've got to buy this first script. I mean, that's where a lot of beginning writers end up with. They, they, they white knuckle that one script and they won't let go of it. And they don't progress because, listen, maybe it's not good, maybe it's too far-fetched to sell, but maybe it's a good writing sample. What's your next idea? So I'm thinking of the idea of normie. You know, I've been watching Wednesday Adams, and so they talk about these normies. And for anybody who ever I felt... haven't watched it yet, but oh, but okay, I'm, okay, I'm, right. but, but, but yeah, I, I have a vague idea what you're talking about. Sure. And so, what if some people aren't writing quote unquote normie comedies? which is for the mainstream, which is going to be seen at a Cineplex, which is going to be seen uh, more in an uh, area where, you know, people's lives are pretty set. There's not, it's, it's not like this crazy sort of eclectic group. And let, that'll be my term for normie. And, and what they're writing is too, too far-fetched, too absurdist. You well, say that there's something for everybody. Well, but that's weird really? because, because what I've heard were that... Uh, were that buyers were looking for something that was edgy, that wasn't normie. And again, you have, you have some executive saying, I want something edgy, something that has, uh, no one has seen before, but what they really are thinking, but that I've seen before so that it's, it's comfortable enough for me to sell it to my, to my bosses. So it's like chasing a joke. You, you know, you, all you can do is is have one eye in the market or maybe uh, half an you know half an eye or maybe half your ear on the market and then write your story and if they don't like this one then write another one and be inspired by the things that you like the the Monty Python used to talk about the fact that they were inspired by the goon show which was this uh, radio comedy on, on in in UK in Britain, they didn't steal it, but they were certainly inspired by it. They were you know kind of the you know they were the children of the Goon Show, and uh, SCTV was inspired by Monty Python. So what inspires you? Go and if you're not inspired by anything, go find something to inspire you, and then. What's your point? What's your take on that? 
how do you want to advance that conversation? So nothing is too far-fetched. What, what there is, is something needs to be relatable. So in other words, uh, some, a writer once came up to my friend Michael Haig, uh, who's a script consultant, and he wrote, you know, how to sell your stories in 60 seconds. And if you can sell your story in 60 seconds, that's a good, that's a good skill. Um, but a, a, a person came up to Michael and said, I've got a script that, that, you know, that no, <laughs> nothing, there's nothing like this ever than, than this script. And Michael said, well, maybe there's a reason for that. <laughs> Meaning that, you know, if something's so weird and un, unaccessible, that maybe that's why people aren't, aren't clamoring for it, because they don't know how to access it. They don't know how to connect to it or relate to it. So if you're sharing something about your life, even if it's through the prism of everything, everywhere, all at once, then that's relatable. It's, you know, it's, it's a family, it's a, it's a relationship that, that literally has gone off the rails and, and it's going to destroy the entire universe. But our families are our universe. So when our, our families go off the rails, that's what it feels like. So it's a metaphor. So, so even though all the multi-dimensional stuff is a lie, the truth is, you know, our families are our universe and, and we, need to, we need to protect them, as well as protect the universe from the ultra, you know, bad lord. What is the normal world? Well, in, in the Comic Hero's Journey, which, which was my second book, uh, I, I tried to translate the hero's journey into a narrative for a comic film. And so uh, the, you know, the hero's journey talks about the ordinary world. So uh, I, I, in the normal world is kind of like that. But what's important about the normal world in, in, a, in a comic narrative is that your hero does not have greatness within him. In, you know, and like in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker has greatness within him. It just has to, you know, be released. In a comic narrative, in your normal world, your hero is as far from has is as far from having greatness within as is humanly possible. Your hero is a nerd, nerd or, or a dweeb or an asshole or, or a jerk. He's, he's, he or she has some missing part to him. There's a hole in your character, but they don't know it. Because if they knew it, they'd do something about it. But in, in comedy after comedy, you, there, you, there's a character who is blind to their own flaws in the beginning of the movie. And if the, if the, inciting incident, if the WTF, if the what the fuck moment doesn't happen, that's the way their life would go. In 40-Year-Old Virgin, he's kind of given up. He's accepted. And, and as a result, he's accepted the fact that he's not, he doesn't have a, a mature adult relationship. And as a result, he's in this kind of stasis of paralyzed immaturity. Uh, and so you see him at home and he's playing, you know, he's playing uh, uh, video games and he's, you know, has little figurines and, you know, and he's dancing to some, you know, Xbox thing. And if the WTF doesn't happen, that's, that's his life. Now we in the audience can see, oh, that's, that's not good, but they can't see it. Bill Murray Phil Connors doesn't see what a jerk he is and how that's not working for him uh, in, the, in the beginning of Groundhog Day. In Bridesmaids, Kristen Wiig is clueless to the fact that she's wasting her time trying to sleep, trying to get John Hamm to let her sleep over once. You know, because he, she, you know, you know, she goes for a booty call and he has her leave and so she has to climb over the gate to get out. And if, and if the inciting incident never happens, that's, that's who Kristen Wiig is going to be in Bridesmaids. She's just going to 
run after worthless guys who don't deserve a minute of her time. So in the normal world, your character, a couple, there are a couple of important things. Your character has flawed or absent relationships. They either don't have a girlfriend or a wife, or if they do, it's not working somehow. It's, it, it needs to be healed. Now in movies where they're eventually going to work it out, you want to see that, uh, that the relationship has, has hit a snag. In, in Date Night, uh, that's the movie with Steve Carell and Tina Fey, you, they've gotten to the point where, where if, he, if Steve Carell gets home a minute too late, she's in her sweats and then no sex. You know, that, that's over. And, and he's always leaving the drawers out. And so they're at this point where they're annoyed and annoying and it's not quite fulfilling, but they're not going to break up. So, so the relationships are either flawed or absent. Um, I usually, you know, encourage or suggest to writers, don't give them a girlfriend in the beginning. Why? Do I want them to be alone and miserable? No. How about give them a, an opportunity to discover somebody, to discover a relationship? Because the most important moments in a narrative are not necessarily the, the big joke and the big gags. The most important moments are moments of realization, discovery, primal moments. And if, you already, if, if they already have a girlfriend, well, then that's one moment you've taken away from them in, in their journey. Um, uh, so there Phil Connors is in Groundhog Day, and he's not going to get involved with Rita because I have a girlfriend. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be there with her eventually. Uh, you know, the, the other important thing about the normal world is that whatever your theme is, that's where you need to introduce the theme right away. What are we talking about? Because you're not going to wait for the big impossible lie, the big event, because it's, it's about, the, the movie is about, from the, from the beginning, from the normal world, what are we talking about? You have to set everything up the theme, as well as all the discoveries, has to be set up within those first 10, 15 pages. Um, I forget the name of the guy who, who directed, the French director who directed uh, The Artist, that, you know, the silent film. He was quoted as saying, I could have had a Tyrannosaurus Rex in my movie if I had introduced it before page 10. Because whatever... Whatever you need to have happen, try to figure out a way to get it to get it into the normal world, or or as quick or as soon after as possible. In Groundhog Day, the first script, the first draft, had him start in the middle of Punxsutawney on day three, panicked. Harold Ramis told Danny Rubin, "I love that. It gets us right into the action. I'm never changing that." It's the first thing they changed. Because how can you pay off any of his progress or lack of progress if we don't see that whole day beat by beat? So that, so that it's got this long first act, this long normal world before the inciting incident. Longer than normal uh, or longer than usual. Um, in the normal world, all your, all your Act 3 problems are Act 1 problems. In fact, all your Act 2 problems are Act 1 problems. That, that you have to set up payoffs. You can't just pay off something. You have to set it up. One of the best examples of that is the beginning of Back to the Future, in which in the very first pan of the movie, we get, even though we don't stop and, and explain what all these pictures mean and what all this device is, we get that he's, we're in the uh, presence of a mad scientist who seemingly has some plutonium under the table. And then he goes to, you know, to school and he meets his girlfriend and some person says, fix the clock. And they give him the piece of paper that he's going to use when he goes back to the past to realize that's when I have to. So everything's set up. In the, in the first five minutes. Him, uh, him playing, wanting to play for his school band 
and being rejected and just giving up. Because that's what needs to change for Michael J. Fox in that movie. He needs to not just give up. This whole family is a family of losers. They, they have to do something about that. Um, so, so that's the normal world. Now, in the normal world, you have the initial goal. The initial goal is what your character thinks they want and thinks that's what they're going to spend their time in the movie getting. The, the initial goal is usually selfish and or short-sighted because there's a discovered goal. After we go through the second part, which is the inciting incident, the comic premise, the WTF, they're in an impossible or improbable situation. And what happens to them is they begin to transform. Outside of their, outside of their desires, you know, against their wishes, they have to transform because the situation has transformed and they have to, they have to do something about it. As that happens, as their transformation happens, there's a discovered goal. The discovered goal is a process of the transformed character realizing that what he or she wanted in the beginning is not what he or she wants now. And that becomes the focus for the development of Act 2 and Act 3. Of the examples that you gave, it sounds like the only one character who really needs to change for others is Phil. The rest of them all needed to change for themselves. Whether it's uh, Annie in Bridesmaids, whether it's... Um, well, does Annie change? She doesn't change. Well, does she develop a little more self-esteem? Oh, no, no, I, I'm sorry. Or maybe I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm getting I'm, the I'm, wrong I thought maybe. you meant the, the character that Maya Rudolph plays. Okay, maybe I'm, I'm thinking of the Kirsten Wiig right. character. Sorry. Right. Okay. Uh, so so she, she needs to develop more self-esteem because she's, she's sabotaging herself. Same thing in The 40-Year-Old Virgin. He, is, he's not really hurting anybody, but he's in this juvenile state. Would you want him to stay there? Uh, no, but but with Phil, he's really like offensive and rude, and he's he's narcissistic and hurts people. Yeah, but but he, but here's the thing: once in Forty Year Old Virgin, once his secret is out, he's either got to quit. He tries to run away. He's either got to quit or do something about it because those guys are not going to let him go. Sure. So he's so he's so he's in a bad spot. He. He either has to quit his job, and he says, that's what I'm going to do. I'll just quit my job because he doesn't want to change, but he has to change because these, these co-workers are going to make him change. Because one of the things that happens in the development of the narrative is connections. Because what's happening is that these isolated characters who start off with absent or flawed relationships gather a family around themselves. And so as they go forth in the narrative, they go forth with this gang that's, that's uh, of, of allies uh, that are helping him or helping her uh, in unexpected ways. One of the best turns that I love in Bridesmaids is that they transform Helen into an ally. You see, in a lesser movie, she'd be an antagonist and she'd be the antagonist all the way throughout. But wonderfully, they, they, they make it so that because of everything that's happened, because of Annie's behavior, uh, you know, the Maya Rudolph has, has run away and you know, the whole wedding's uh, uh, you know, in, in peril. And so Helen has to come to Annie to save the day. And so that's, I mean, I thought that that was, that was such a smart move on their part because you don't need antagonists in comedy. You can have an antagonist. You don't need one. You don't, you know, whereas in an action film, you got to have an antagonist. You know, uh, you know, every Marvel film is, is as good as the villain they have in the Marvel film. But in comedy, 
Who's the antagonist in Groundhog Day? Himself. Who's the antagonist in, uh, in, in Bridesmaids? Well, Helen, but, but maybe it's also, it's also uh, Annie herself. Um, so you, you, have, you have these families that come together. Uh, Annie, in the beginning, has one friend. One friend and no prospects. By the end, she has Melissa McCarthy coming to her house and biting her on the butt in order to get out of her depression. This is life, Annie. This is life is biting you on the butt. Um, it's such a smart script. Uh, and it's because the script is written with, with you know, equal, equal amounts of compassion and observation. Sure, and if you see the Rita character, uh, she's, she's level-headed, she's kind, and so she's a great contrast to Phil. Right, she's... she's the, not even bothered that he's a jerk. She's the magical <laughs> object of desire. Uh, in, in many romantic comedies, you have a magical object of desire. Meryl Streep in Defending Your Life with, with uh, Al, Albert Brooks is the magical object of desire. That's, that's a, a, a man or a woman who transforms your character. Uh, you, you know, in romantic comedy, love is, is itself a magical power. Because, you know, you talk to a psychiatrist, psychiatrists will tell you, you know, people don't really change. You, know, you, you hope they change, but they don't really change. You marry a jerk, 30 years later, you have a fatter, bolder, older jerk. But in romantic comedies, characters trans jerks transform dweebs and nerds transform because of the power of the love. It's what Jack Nicholson says in As Good As It Gets, you make me want to be a better man. You make me want to be a better man. What are the steps in the comic hero's journey? Yeah, there are seven steps. Uh, I recently read a, a paper that, that referenced the comic hero's journey and they talked about how I shoehorned the 12 steps of the hero's journey into seven, into seven steps of the comic hero's journey. And I did that, you know, just because, you know, safe space, make it a little, <laughs> make it a little bit more economical. Um, Can I okay. see the cover of your book? Stay so the hero's book. journey, we have the normal world, which we talked about, and WTF, that's the comic premise. And then you have reaction. Um, in reaction, you have your character in this transformed state or this transformed uh, circumstance, but they don't want to be there. Uh, it's, it's Dorothy wanting to go home. It's uh, uh, Phil Connors in Groundhog Day trying to figure out how do I get out of this? So, so there's first denial and then the reaction is, okay, this is happening. How, how do I not make it happen? How do I go back? How do I fix this? Um, and, and in some cases, it's unfixable. Like uh, in Big, he goes to sleep as a 13-year-old boy. He wakes up, he's a 30-year-old man. But it doesn't need to be an impossible. It could be improbable. In Enough Said, a uh, film with Julia Louis-Dreyfus and the late, great James Gandolfini, Julia Louis-Dreyfus is a, is a massage therapist. And she finds out that her new boyfriend is the ex-husband of her new best friend, both of you know who she now is is giving massages to. So when she gives massages to her new best friend, who tells terrible things about her ex-husband, she then reacts to it when she's on a date with James Gandolfini, who's the ex-husband. And so as she's trying to figure out what to do about it, she's carrying on a, a, a mild deception. She's simply not telling either one about the other, but. But in the beginning, she's trying to make, make believe like this is not an impossible situation to be in. And of course, uh, in that movie, when it blows up, it destroys her relationship, uh, which is what happens in a movie at uh, the all is lost moment. But you have the reaction, then you have connections. In connections, your characters are forming a nucleus around themselves, a, 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 a family, uh, friends that they hadn't had before. And what you have in that section is things are starting to slow down. You have characters who are 
who up till then had not even had a conversation with each other, and now they're kind of opening up to each other. In, in some comedies, the opening up is uh, a little bit ridiculous, um, but in, in many comedies, it's where the characters for the first time are relating to, to other characters uh, in a way that they hadn't before. Um, one of the things I want to talk about in terms of these seven steps is they don't have to happen all in the same order. They don't have to happen all at the same page. You know, this page, this has to happen because they all happen in different ways. In 40 year old virgin, the connections start pretty soon after, uh, after the, uh, lie, after the truth about his being a virgin comes out. Uh, he goes, to work, they make fun of him, he runs away. And Paul Rudd, because Paul Rudd is a nice guy. Uh, he's the guy who's all emo and he's still <laughs> yearning after his girlfriend. He runs after him and he chases him down. He doesn't have to. If Paul Rudd doesn't chase him down, there's no movie. That's the end of the movie. That you know, Steve Carell has 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 um has has you know quit. But he chases him down and they go and they have a cup of coffee together, and it's the first time that they're talking to each other. And uh, Steve Carell even says, you know, this is the first time we've had a conversation of more than, more than, you know, two minutes. And connections is where your character who up till that point had been a loner or uh, either through choice or, or through their own circumstances, and they begin to gather a group around themselves, a group that can become their friends. I mean, in Bridesmaids, she literally has a group of bridesmaids that first she's very antagonistic to, or, or she, uh, she gives them all food poisoning because she's trying too hard. But at the end, they, they have all bonded. So that's what happens in Connections. And in Connections, you slow the pace down so that people can have real conversations. Um, one of the things that Monty Python discovered when they did their first movie, uh, and now for something completely different, which was a compilation of sketches that they had done on TV. And they did this movie for the American market because at that time, Monty Python was still not being shown in America. And they did a test screening and they found out in the test screening, it went great for the first 45 minutes. People were laughing hysterically and then they just stopped for the next 45 minutes. And they, the Pythons kind of looked at each other and thought, well, maybe we have it, we have this in the wrong order. So they reshuffled some of the sketches and they did another screening. And again, for the first 45 minutes, people were peeing in their pants and then it stopped because you just cannot make an audience laugh for 90 minutes nonstop without giving them something to chew on, without giving them some protein. And that's why for their next two movies, well, especially, especially A Life of Brian, they gave you characters you could care about and characters who are going through a trauma and trying to find their way out of it. So even though the Pythons were very sketch-based and even though Life of Brian is still a series of sketches, it was still telling a story about a guy that you identified with and, and empathized with. So that's why it's so important at some point in your movie to slow down, to reveal themselves. It's what Michael Haig calls the getting naked, which in a romantic comedy doesn't necessarily mean the uh, people are, are having sex. It means that's the moment where uh, in Hitch, Will Smith is revealing to the girl why he's become the love doctor because he was not the love doctor in college. In fact, he was the, exactly the opposite. And so this is his reaction to that. Um, after uh, Connections comes New Directions. This is where the, the discovered goal really kicks in. In New Directions, your character has become somewhat accustomed to the impossible or improbable situation. And what has happened is new skills have arrived. Not because your character sat back and thought, I want to uh, improve myself, but because they've had to. They're forced to transform. 
And so in New Directions, your character literally tries to go for something, has a, the discovery goal, go for something that they hadn't even thought of in the beginning of the movie. In the beginning of the movie is Steve Carell in 40 Year Old Virgin, is he thinking about having a relationship with a woman? No, doesn't even, it's not even on the, uh, uh, on the horizon. Uh, in the beginning of the movie, does uh, Phil Connors want to have a relationship, pursue a relationship without sex with Rita? No. Uh, you know, we, at first he tries to get her to go to bed with him, but he's unsuccessful because she's not that kind of a girl to go to bed with a guy, you know, in, in the first day. And so he gets to a point where he just wants to be in her company and spends as much time with her as he can in her company because he, he's fallen in love with her and, and he can't figure out a way to get out of the time loop. So he just becomes the best boyfriend in the world. Uh, somebody who's not grasping for something, not, not having some ulterior motive, just there for other people. Danny Rubin's a Buddhist. So is Harold Ramis for that fact. And so uh, the Buddhist philosophy infuses um, uh, the Groundhog Day because the whole point is uh, they answered the question, how can you be a, a good person in the world? And the answer is to be of service to other people. So then you have the lost night of the soul, uh, the dark night of the soul, in which the all is lost sequence. Now, in a romantic comedy, this is often when the lovers break apart, which happens, you know, kind of two thirds or three quarters of the way through. But even in a film as ridiculous and as offensive as Tropic Thunder, um, there's a breakup. They, the, the platoon literally breaks up from Ben Stiller and the rest of the actors in the make-believe pl platoon. And that happens about 50% of the way through the movie. So all these, all these stations of the cross occur. They just don't occur all at the same place, all at the same time. And the, and those, and the, the progression can alter based upon the need of the story. The last uh, section is uh, race to the finish. Again, in many romantic comedies, you have a character literally racing to to his loved one. In When Harry Met Sally, Bill, Billy Crystal is racing through the streets to get to the New Year's Eve party to express, however ineptly, his love to Meg Ryan. But even in Enough Said, uh, your character needs to take some positive action. I've read several scripts where at the end, the good thing happens to the character, happens to the protagonist, the protagonist does nothing to accomplish that. That's probably a mistake. That's, I know that's a mistake because, because your character has to take positive action to, to uh, accomplish what they need to accomplish, to get what they need to get, um, and to resolve not just the narrative, but also the theme. In Enough Said, she's broken up, Julia Louis-Dreyfus is broken up with James Gandolfini and it's broken her heart. She broke up with him because the deception that her new best friend was his ex-wife and she was nagging about, nagging about him about his weight because that's what his wife was filling Julia Louis-Dreyfus' head with during their massage therapy sessions. So he breaks up with her for deception. So every now and then she drives past his house and just parks. Just looks out the window. That's all she does, just drive and park. And one day he comes out, he sits on the, on the stoop and she looks at him and he looks at her and kind of goes, good one. So the, the important elements of Race to the Finish you don't have to show us a happy ending, but you have, to, you have to hint at the promise of a better world. You don't have to have the lovers come together, but we, we have to know that it's going to be okay. Um, in The Breakup, which is this 
kind of revolutionary, unsuccessful rom-com with Vince Vaughn and, um, oh, she's the girl from Friends. Courtney Cox? No, no. the other one. Oh, uh, Kudrow. Lisa Kudrow? No, the other one. Uh, Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, Dennis Tell her okay. what you've won. Uh, in in uh, <laughs> The Breakup, which is this kind of revolutionary, unsuccessful comedy with Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston, they, they have this big fight. They break up. There's all this deception happening. Um, and then Vince Vaughn does the speech. You know the speech? It's the speech that melts the heart of of the magical object of desire. It's the speech that makes the person go, you had me at hello. Uh, and, but what was interesting about, interesting but unsuccessful about the film is that he does the speech, everybody in the audience is prepared for her to go, oh, Vince Vaughn. And she goes, no, not having it, too late. Oh my God, they've really broken up. The film's called The Breakup. We should have figured that out. So they, they had a, a, a final scene in which they meet at a, at a, like a, a fair somewhere in Chicago. And Vince Vaughn has a new date that looks exactly like Jennifer Aniston. And Jennifer Aniston has a new date that looks exactly like Vince Vaughn. And there's this uncomfortable dialogue and then they part. And it tested terribly because even though the, it was a cute joke, it left us feeling horrible about spending two hours in this unsuc... I mean, we've had our own breakups. We don't want to have to live through it again. So did they get the, the, the couple together? No. All they did, using the same exact dialogue, was they kind of meet each other on a street in Chicago, and one of them's holding a bag of groceries. And they have the same exact dialogue. They didn't change a word. Only this time, it was, you got, you felt that they were okay. They had had this relationship, it broke up. They're okay, and they might not be friends, but they're okay. And it was a much, much better ending to the film because you need to give us the, pro if not the happy ending. You don't need to give us a happy ending. It can be an indie film. But you need to give us the promise of a better world. Um, the other important thing about Race to the Finish is that you're not finished when the lovers kiss. That's not the end of the film. That's not the end of the story. You need to finish the theme. You need to complete the theme. What's the question you're asking? Well, what's the answer? You have to make the theme complete before the film is complete, before the narrative's complete, as opposed to just ending the story. So those, those are the seven steps, which I've shoehorned. I've shoehorned the 12 steps from the hero's journey into, into shoehorned them into the comic hero's journey, which, by the way, oh, look at there. Look, it's, it's and, the comic hero's journey, fans. Would you say protagonists and comedies are kind of pathetic? Not necessarily. Um, Harold Ramis had this idea that when he started writing and directing, uh, all, the all the comic protagonists were kind of nebbishy and pathetic, like, a, like in a Woody Allen film. But, he, but his take was what he was interested in were the rebels, the iconoclasts, the people who don't fit in. And that's why Meatballs... Ghostbusters, um, uh, their, you know, uh, Groundhog Day, you, you, you know, Stripes. He has he has these characters that are they're still not perfect. They're still not heroes because they lack decorum. They lack you know kind of maturity. But they they're they're rebels. That's because that's how he saw himself. And so so your comic protagonist doesn't need to fit the uh, cookie cutter form of some other character that you're not interested in. Write about the characters that you're interested in. Only remember they're human, meaning they're fallible, meaning you can't accrue to them all the wonderful qualities you wish you had. 
you have to give them the qualities that they have and you know and and you have to lead them on a journey somewhere so when you say iconoclast so they're they're kind of misfits they don't fit yeah in. M- misfits rebels that's who you like to write about mm-hmm. so so i think it's a mistake to think that every every uh uh protagonist has to be a nebbish or or a dweeb they can be uh you know kind of a a jerk or 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 somebody who's self-serving or just doesn't fit into the group for whatever or does, reason. Or doesn't fit into the group for some reason. How are characters in comedies different than other genres? They're funnier. No. Um, again, uh, a character in comedy is, is the term that we use in the hidden tools of comedy is non-hero. A non-hero is somebody who lacks some, if not all, the essential skills and tools with which to win. So that describes all of us. We all lack some, if not all, the essential skills and tools with which to win. We're not omnipotent. We're not immortal. Uh, we're not omniscient. Um, some of us have bad, you know, uh, you know bad coor- eye hand eye coordination. Uh, so so we we are flawed, and so in in. Uh, a comic protagonist, uh, your protagonist is flawed only to the extent that they need to be flawed. In other words, you don't need to make him the stupidest person in the world. Because listen, as we like to say, you're not as smart as you'd like to think you are. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're just, you're just human. So, so you don't need to, by, by making somebody a clown, uh, that's that's another mask. You see, you put a mask on a character and uh, on a heroic character, and you give them the attributes: brave, resourceful, this and that. Uh, by making somebody an idiot, uh, the stupidest person in the world, um, you're still putting a mask on them, and you're st- and but now you're condescending to them. And you're saying what you're basically saying is that that person, what a jerk, what an idiot. Um, not me though. I'm I'm the smart writer. I'm I'm so much smarter than the characters I'm writing. And I would I would suggest, well, you know, have a little sympathy, because you know that character, even if it's an anthropomorphic chicken. That character's a human being, and so are you. So, you know, you're all going to end up in the same place. So maybe you shouldn't spend your time condescending. Maybe you should spend your time connecting and, and you know, observing, you know, not, not letting somebody off easy, not whitewashing something. But uh, the genius of comedy is that it loves humanity without forgiving them. And in Revenge of the Nerds, it was it was set up that we all sort of looked down on these various characters until they had their comeuppance. Except that in Revenge of the Nerds, even though we kind of knew that they were they were losers, on the other hand, so are we. I mean, how many of us empathize and related to the good looking blonde-haired, blue-eyed, perfect-teeth frat boys. No, we, 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 in our heads, we're all losers. In our heads, we're all misfits. In our heads, we're all um, less than. And the genius of comedy is that it knows that. And it says, it's okay. Your secret's safe with me. I'll be the jerk. I'll be the loser for all of you. Because the reality is, is that that's what frightens us more than, more than, more than death. You know what's the most frightening thing to people? Public speaking. Because in public speaking, you're exposed. Am I smart enough? Do I look good enough? And that's what we all fear, that we're going to be exposed. And a comedian is the person who simply has the courage to get up in front of a large group of strangers and admits to being human. Whereas many of us, you know, we don't admit it. You know, we're, we're, we're perfect. 
Well, at least we want you to think that we're perfect. How many of us go to our boss and say, boy, am I a screw up today? I got this all wrong. No, <laughs> if we screw up, we try desperately to hide it. What are the common character archetypes in comedy? Okay, I, I can give you some character types, um, but I, I, want to, uh, I want to have a caveat um, that uh, the, the danger is in thinking of these archetypes as, uh, as characters that you can utilize and push around. They're, they're, they're just slivers of us, right? They're just, they're just uh, uh, fractions of our own psyche and our own personality. Uh, and, you, and you divide them so as to help in storytelling. For instance, in Friends, you have the wise guy, you have the dits, you have the mother, you have the, the stupid guy, uh, and you have the nerd, and you have the, um, the flirty girl. Okay? Now, why do you have those six? Because how would it be if you had two wise guys? Well, who are you going to give the line to? Okay, you need, to, you need somebody to say something stupid. Who do you want on stage? Who do you want in the scene? You want Joey in the scene. Okay, now you want somebody to be ditzy, but not stupid. Okay, so let's bring Phoebe on. So the purpose of, of, of utilizing archetypes is not that you're, you're, they're not stereotypes. They are, they are representations of a certain point of view, of a certain way of, way of being and thinking. But within the archetype, they're still people. So, so you don't want to write them exclusively as though they have no other attribute. Um, the, you have um, various kinds of, of uh, tricksters uh, in, in Greek comedy. Um, in Greek comedy, uh, there were uh, all sorts of different slave characters and master characters, and what happens in Roman comedy is that they did away with 50-man chorus, but for Roman comedy, they heightened the archetypical characters that had been around since early Greek time. And then, after Roman comedy, there's no comedy, because that's the Dark Ages, and there's no theater, and there's no literacy, and there's no playwrights, but they're still actors. And so what do the actors do? The actors either act out scenes from the Bible, or they act out scenes using these, archa these archetypical, iconic characters. The clever, tricky servant, the uh, dim uh, young man, uh, the courtesan, the braggage soldier. All these types were known to this, these traveling players who were making things up, uh, improvising, based on character and situation. So around the Renaissance, you have this theater form that coalesces around characters called the Commedia dell'Art. And basically, you have an art form in which the characters stayed the same because they all wore distinctive masks and tights. So if you saw the hook nose and the diamond tights, ah, that's Harlequin. He's kind of like a Charlie Chaplin mischievous man-child. Um, like Kramer. If Kramer comes through the door, you know exactly what you're getting. In Europe, when the Harlequin came out, you knew exactly what you were getting. So you have these very specific archetypes. So what happens is, is that there are no playwrights, there are no directors, so you have a situation in which the character takes the action. Let's say you have two, two um, young, a young boy and a girl sitting on a park bench. What's their physical motion? They, you know, if they're both young and good looking and not that bright there, you know, they're gonna try to, you know, get together. Let's take away the young man, let's put in the lecherous old man. Uh, the, the, you know, what, you know, the pantalone was, was what he was called in, in the Commedia. Uh, he could be a miser, he could be uh, a hypochondriac. Uh, he's usually after the young girl. So now what's their physical movement? Young girl, lecherous old man. He's gonna chase her around the bench, right? 
let's take away the young girl. Let's put in the battle axe wife. Oh, now what's the movement? Now she's chasing him the other way. Let's take them both away. Let's put in three zanies. Zany was a term in the Commedia short for Giovanni, meaning um, there was the clever servant, there was the stupid servant, there was the compassionate servant, um, all these different varieties of stupid servants or clever, tricky servants. They're all going to go in different directions, but they're, because they're idiots, they're going to knock heads and knock each other out. So the Commedia teaches us that character creates plot, character creates action, and character creates movement. So we, we, inter we then take this idea, this actor-centric idea, and in modern comedy, you have this same idea, these same characters, but the situation changes, say, on a weekly basis. What does that sound like? Sounds like sitcoms. So, so you have these archetypical characters. You have, um, uh, you can have the fool. You can have the, the, the wise guy. You can have um, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, old, you know, the, the old man or the, uh, the, the father. But that's only one way of slicing and dicing. Because you can slice and dice them any way you want, any way that makes sense. The important thing is not to have four of the same character, because you don't need four of the same character. Um, uh, you, uh, there's, there's, there's a guy who likes to see every cast as uh, the Wizard of Oz. Well, who's our Dorothy? Who's our Tin Man? That's our, uh, our Cowardly Lion. Other people use Winnie the Pooh, okay? Uh, in, in, in Seinfeld, uh, Kramer's Tigger, you know, the really bouncy one. Who's George? He's Eeyore. Um, so, that, so that it's less important. The, uh, there's a book out uh, about the, the different character types in comedy. My, my, my preference is that the only character that you absolutely need in a comedy is a trickster. You need somebody who is going to bend the rules, color outside the box. You may have a fool in your, in your cast. You may have a wise guy. You may have um, a, a magical object of desire. What you do have are blocking characters and mirror characters. Blocking characters are characters that are going to get in the way of your main character. Maybe an antagonist, but doesn't necessarily have to be. In Groundhog Day, the insurance salesman, he's a blocking character. He, he, you know, he's, he's in the way, and eventually, uh, when Bill Murray realizes there's no consequences for anything, he just punches him out. He doesn't say a word, he just punches him out. And then you have mirror characters who are your best friends. But you only really, and there are, there are uh, uh, rookie characters, there's... Um, you know, vet, you know, uh, grizzled old vets characters. Uh, in in the comic hero's journey, you have mentors. Mentors are usually idi you know idiots, uh, idiots who have some knowledge. In in the hero's journey, the mentor is Obi Wan Kenobi. Uh, in the comic hero's journey, the mentor is the guy in Dodgeball who throws wrenches at Justin Long's head because he says, "If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball." Uh, an idiot, but still a mentor character. But, you, but the only character that you absolutely need is an archetype. And just know that, that your, your task is to slice up personality and, and your own humanity so that you don't have duplications in your cast. Some other characters that are essential in comedy are the voice of reason. Oftentimes, the voice of reason is somebody that nobody pays attention to or gives any credit to. Uh, in a lot of movies, that's Jay Baruchel, uh, who's actually, in, in Tropic Thunder, he's the one who's read, actually read the guidebook and can read a map, but nobody pays any attention to him. Um, but another important character is the animal character, uh, a character who's primal. You know, Melissa McCarthy in, in Bridesmaids, uh, also Melissa McCarthy in everything. 
um, <laughs> John Belushi in, in Animal House. So somebody who is um, going to uh, act out of their primal urges and is very forceful and physical about it. Uh, your magical object of desire, that's usually the focus of attention for your comic protagonist in a rom-com. With the Golden Girls, seemingly on the outside, everybody looked the same. So you couldn't really just by, you'd have to watch the show to figure out which right. one was the flirt, which one was the trickster, which one was the wise one. Right. And, and so, but that took time you, because they all looked the same and you thought but, they were on the but same But in day. writing it, they knew exactly how to write it because every character had their function. Not just their personality, but they also had their function. So if you're going to give somebody something sharp to say, you're going to give it to the old person, right? If you're going to give something, somebody something uh, stupid to say, that's what Betty White was there right, for. Right, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Or, or Ruth or, McClanahan. Or, or, yeah, Ruth was the, she, she was more the flirt. Yes. And was always bragging about all these conquests and these right. different things. And then uh, with... Um, Sorry, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, Maud, I'm trying to think of her Maud. Name. Uh, yeah, 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 she's she's ba <laughs> she's basically the Alex Rieger of that bunch. You know, you you often have a, a father. Uh, yes, uh, there's another friend of mine who likes to think of every every cast as a family. Who's the father? Who's the mother? Who's the who's the weird uncle? Who's the uh, the cousin you don't like to talk to? And he kind of divides them like this. How does a buddy comedy movie differ from a romantic comedy? They probably are not having sex. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, in a buddy comedy, um, they're getting intimate. And it's about learning how to get intimate in a way that they haven't been intimate before. So, so the, you know, part, of, part of the comic trope is you get them as close to having sex as you can without making it kind of this, you know, creepy or graphic. But what's one of the classic comic buddy comedies out there? Planes, trains, and automobiles. And what's one of the funniest sequences when they have to sleep together? Because it's about learning to, in a buddy comedy, they have to learn to drop defenses and, and become more intimate than they already have. If you start with a buddy, like in Wedding Crashers, they seem like they're great buddies, but it's so superficial because their goal is superficial to just work together to seduce women at weddings. But what happens after them is they both get into dilemmas. They both find women that they really like, uh, some of whom kind of confuse them. Um, and they both have to help themselves to resolve their problems. So, uh, so a good buddy movie is a movie in which uh, both characters need to change in some way. And, and somehow this pairing, um, either the pairing itself is the, is the inciting incident or something happens to them that changes their relationship and changes the way that they react to each other and they react to the world at large. The one thing I want to say about the difference between the hero's journey and the comic hero's journey, I think one of the important differences is in the hero's journey, the hero is greatness within and is eventually going to heal the world. In the comic hero's journey, the hero has to heal himself or herself. The world's fine or the world's not fine. The world is the way the world is. But the comic hero is not, is not integrated well into that world. And in whatever way that comic hero exhibits his or her personality, it's we in the audience can see that's not working for them. Bill Murray's a jerk and eventually he'll be alone. He'll be a jerk all by himself. Steve Carell in 40-Year-Old Virgin, he's a nice guy, but he's going to be alone too. Neither one of those are really going to work. Kristen Wiig in Bridesmaids, oh my God. You know, I hope she can stop trying to uh, let John Hamm have his booty calls. So, so the world isn't changing, 
they have to change. And I think the lesson for us is that, yeah, we, we can try to change the world, but, you know, changing ourselves uh, is both more immediate and, and, and more to the point. What's the structure of a buddy comedy, whether it's buddy cop, whether it's groomsmen, whether it's swingers with John Favreau? Uh, I, think, I think the structure is, is still basically the same. You have the normal world. How do they normally get together? How, do they, how does this world work for them in, in the usual way? Then something happens to change it. Something, something happens to, to make the normal change. And then it goes through the rest. I think then it goes through the rest of the steps. I'm, I'm not sure I have a, a clever or insightful answer to that because I think it's, I mean, I could look at individual movies and talk about how their individual structures are different, but as a genre, um, buddy movies are, are uh, structured the same as other comedy movies with, with some impossible or improbable thing uh, happening that forces these characters to change. In the other guys, Will Farrell and Mark Wahlberg uh, are the other guys. They're, they're the, not the hero cops. They're not the cops who can do anything and could you know, solve every crime and beat every bad. They're the other guys. And when the hero cops are killed and they have to step up, that's the WTF. That's, is it impossible? No, it's improbable that these two guys, so different, have to work together to, you know, solve the crime, to, to, to you know, do what they need to do for the police force. So I think, it's, I think it's structured fairly the same in terms of normal world. They have, they have their fall, their flaws, their faults, and everything's going to stay the same until the inciting incident, and then they have to transform. And as they transform, they begin to open up to each other and they begin to learn new skills and they begin to transform so that uh, Will Farrell becomes more heroic uh, and Mark Wahlberg becomes um, uh, a little smarter about what he does. So they, they kind of learn from each other. That, that happens in a lot of buddy movies. The, the, the movie, the, the part of that movie that I love so much is where uh, Will Ferrell introduces Mark uh, to his wife, who's this gorgeous supermodel. And, and all Mark Wahlberg can say is, come on, you're kidding, right? Or, you know, because he, can, he, he, can't, he can't understand it. So I thought that was very funny. What should a writer know before beginning a buddy comedy movie? I think he needs to know how these two characters complement each other and antagonize each other. I think that's, I mean, that, that's one thing they need to know is that, is that you're putting two characters um, in a situation that they're both uncomfortable with, both maybe the situation itself or, or certainly each other. And so, it can't just be antagonism. It's got to be a situation in which, as the narrative progresses, the, the one, char one character has to have something to offer to the other character. The other character has to have something to offer to the first character. It can't be one way. Um, in, in 48 hours, uh, you know, Nick Nolte is this can do it cop but you know uh, Eddie Murphy has some has some chops too and and he can add to what Nick Nolte can do because Eddie Murphy has has his his humor his cleverness his his improvisational skills his ability to to kind of take advantage of any kind of situation um, and Nick Nolte is this big bull of a guy uh, so they have to you have to figure out what do they need to learn and can they learn from each other. It's not just enough to have um, a tall guy and a short guy, a fat guy and a skinny guy. Uh, the buddy comedy has to explore what does it mean to 
be intimate with another person and to learn from another person. And if you take the female sort of flip side, like um, Two Broke Girls, they, even though that's a TV show, they, they, they were still able to, they didn't really seem to get under each other's skin as much. Right. They, they, they were in this together. Right, but they have to get in, uh, into each other's skin to a certain extent. I mean, the odd couple. They certainly get, you know, that was a play that had, that had you know, a begin, you know, a WTF, and then it, it, they, they started to hate each other. There was a big fight, but then they learned that they needed each other because they're both divorced guys, and they, you know, they need, they need the friendship. So, so it's, it's, it's about. I think the thing that you have to do is, is sometimes when you write a buddy comedy, you're saying, well, that's the dumb guy, or that's the loser guy. And you condescend to that character. You write down to that character, and you have to remember, you know, what if what if you're the loser guy, you know? So so you have to realize that that they both have something to offer each other, and then in the beginning they don't know that. And yeah, that's great too. Even if this is not this is more romantic comedy, but with uh, the Bridget Jones diary, Renee Zellweger's character is 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 not a bad person, but she's always fumbling and you know pantyhose dress in the pantyhose kind of a thing and and y you it's hard to look down on her because she's still lovable right I mean they they design it that way but she's still someone that you want to embrace and you'd want to be friends. right but but it's not her fault that she and that she goes to the party in a in a buddy suit somebody <laughs> somebody set her up sure but but what's lovely about her is she tries to make the best of it